Order! 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 You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Yes, it's just over four hours to go. As you said, hundreds of thousands of people have signed up since midnight. We'll be discussing how many more risk missing out in a few moments. But first, the referendum campaign has been really pretty bad-tempered from the word go, and today was no exception. David Cameron called a surprise press conference to list six untruths that he accused Vote Leave of peddling to, quote, con voters. The Leave campaign said that showed Remain was in a blind panic and called the Prime Minister chicken for refusing to take part in head-to-head -head debates. One of the main disagreements between the two sides is whether leaving the EU and the single market would harm Britain or make us more open to world trade. Our political editor, Gary Gibbon, has been investigating. We are starting to get to panic stations, one Remain campaigner said. With Downing Street off limits for campaign press conferences, the Prime Minister took to a roof to say that on economic arguments, he had expert opinion on his side. The Leave camp were making it up. So there you have it. Credible experts warning about risks to our economic security on the one side and a series of assertions that turn out to be completely untrue on the other. A Leave campaign resorting to total untruths to con people into taking a leap in the dark. At the heart of Remain's case is that Brexit harms the British economy. And at the centre of that argument is trade. They argue that if Britain leaves Europe, it'll find it harder to trade with continental partners. That will hurt productivity. And that will hurt growth. But are they right? You've been deprived of the ability to create about 284,000 jobs in this country alone, in the UK, because of the EU's failure to do free trade deals. This is the chance for us to glo go global. Boris Johnson was campaigning in Ipswich, just down the road from Felixstowe, Britain's busiest container port. 42% of these containers go to Europe. If we left, what trade relationship would we have? At the beginning of this debate, Vote Leave talked a lot about getting a deal like Norway has. Three days sailing from here in that direction, or landlocked Switzerland. Full or partial access to the single market, in return for paying fees, observing EU regulations and committing to freedom of movement of people. Since then, Vote Leave have talked a lot more about getting a deal like Canada has with the EU. Many fewer strings attached. But would the EU really be up for that? You think if we came out of it, it would do us no damage, that it would do us no harm? Do you think that our erstwhile partners are going to put up a sign? You know, oh, sorry you're leaving, but don't worry. You can have all the same benefits, just the same. No, of course they're not. They're not naive. Former Trade Secretary Peter Lilly believes Europe would sign a decent deal with Britain. But even if they didn't, their tariffs aren't so high, it would be fine. The exports we send to Europe, if they faced Europe's external tariff, would average about 2.4%. And when you think that the movement in the exchange rate, 10% up or 10% down, absolutely unpredictable, doesn't stop us trading with them. Why would 2.5%? A, a bit of an irrelevance, free it trade is, bills. It, it, exaggerated in their importance. Exaggerated in importance. They're in the icing on the cake. <laughs> I'd rather not have any tariffs at all. That would be better. But it's of minor importance. If Britain leaves, what happens with the 53 trade deals that the EU has already signed with other countries? Miriam Clegg met her husband Nick when they were both working at the European Commission. For 10 years she worked there on trade. I have brought for you the example of the South Korea agreement, actually a, a rather plain vanilla agreement this in relation to this is an easy one. Surely some countries uh, that have an agreement at the moment with the EU could turn around to Britain after it's left the EU and just say, actually we'll just stick to the agreement that we've got with the EU. We'll, we'll just copy it. We'll just send all that to the photocopier, different signatures on it, that would be it. They can do that. Oh, of course they can. Like, they can offer to the UK preferential access in exchange for nothing. It is just very rare that in the trade world, where everything is you give, I take and I give something back to you, that they would want to do that. Because for all intents and purposes, this is like a breach of contract. We have negotiated something and you have promised that for the access to whatever financial services, that is one of the priorities in the UK, that they would have in exchange access for their products to a very, very large market. 
if there is Brexit, is a much smaller. The European Union always considers trade deals primarily political and inserts in them a human rights clause. It was that which meant that the uh, deal with Canada took so long because Canada rather objected to Europe saying that they had the right to monitor the human rights of the Canadians. The Indian Indians too uh, object to that sort of thing. Um, we, We're going to throw all, all that out the window if it's Britain on our own. We've never thought that, that was part of a trade deal. Uh, we don't make trade dependent on the uh, internal politics of a country and nor should we. Vote Leave say Britain should trade in the supposed clout that comes with being part of a larger economic group. Instead it should go solo in the trade world. It'll be lighter on its feet than the European Union, the argument goes, and there'll be a queue of eager trading partners only too happy to sign up to deals with Britain. Some think the protectionist mood abroad since 2008 means it's not a great moment for free trade deals. They include the man who heads the World Trade Organization, Roberto Azevedo. He thinks Britain could be waiting a long time to get the deals it wants. Some negotiations, some trade negotiations take almost 20 years or more. So some are faster. It depends on how important the economy, the bigger the economy, like the UK, one of the largest economies in the world, others are going to pay a lot of attention. They're not just going to hurriedly decide on anything. I think there will be a, a, a very uh, difficult moment uh, for the investor to put their money in a, in a country where they don't know what the rules are, what the rules will be uh, for maybe several years. If I was India or Brazil or America, I'd be thinking, well, they need us. They need us a bit more now they're on their own than they did when they were part of that lot. So I'm going to drive a harder bargain. I think there'll be some of that in it. But there again, yes, we do, but they need us too, don't they? They, they need us. It's, it's a two-way street. What will be really important is the quality of the capacity of the people that we put into the deal. But it's been 43 years since Britain handed over responsibility for trade to Brussels. And Whitehall's army of trade experts and trade negotiators is long gone. It was not just a, 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 a board of trade, it was a, a, a kind of a cross Whitehall skill which was there and was necessary. How many do you think are left? Um, I'm told uh, that there are two, but I think that may be an exaggeration. If Remain triumphs, it could be Margaret Thatcher's brainchild, the single market that wins it for them. If Leave wins, it could be people decided there were other trade opportunities out there. It could be they had something else on their mind. Movement of people, not freight. Gary Gibbon, Channel 4 News, Felix Stowe. Well, now, uh, it's one of the biggest uh, multinational companies in the world, but also one that's very much entwined with Europe. Uh, the Anglo-Dutch company Unilever has headquarters in both London and the Netherlands, making household products from Marmite to Persil. It employs around 7,500 people in Britain, but with a supply chain of up to 200,000. Well, earlier I spoke to its chief executive, Paul Polman. He believes that Britain would be better off staying in the EU and that jobs and investments would be at risk from Brexit. So I began by asking what would be the implications for Unilever itself if the UK voted to leave Europe. We have benefited on the positive side enormously from being part of Europe. The harmonization of, uh, of standards has allowed us to do economies of scale in our products. The boundaries that have come down have allowed us to transport products back and forth. The help that we're getting in terms of research, the people movements in uh, between the, the continent and the UK has made us very, very successful. And I think the UK has benefited from that. Were that to disappear with an exit vote, it will have serious consequences, not only for Unilever, but for any company in the UK. But what do you think Unilever would do? I mean, would you move the headquarters, for example? Well, we are a dually listed company. We are anglo Dutch, as you know. We have about one third of our business in Europe as a company, even more so of our profitability. And were Britain to exit, uh, then we seriously have to look at parts of uh, running our business or how we uh, structure our business to accommodate that. Can I quote something you said in January 2014? Uh, if it happened, we'd have to th rethink bringing billions of euros of investment into the United Kingdom if the UK ends up leaving the EU. 
Well, absolutely. If you now look at... That's still the case. Uh, we certainly will have to relook at that. Let me just give you one simple example. Let's take our ice cream, for example, one of our Walls products, uh, Magnum. Undoubtedly, if the UK will leave, the conditions will not be as good as if they stay in. That is a, a fact that I think uh, is broadly accepted. Well, how does that affect ice cream? Uh, for example, you will have uh, uh, import duties on dairy. Uh, anybody from outside the EU has import duties that could be up to 40 percent, 50 percent. So the price of dairy products will go up, the price of ice cream will go up, and ultimately the consumer will pay the price for that. And that, I guess, could therefore be extended across all your products. Oh, absolutely. The food uh, barriers that Europe has right now in terms of import duties are about 15%. The UK is excluded from that. Consumers here are obviously getting the benefit from that, access to lower prices, access to more goods. Were that to disappear, you'll see a dampening effect on the UK economy that some people estimate could be up to 5%. That dampening effect will undoubtedly put jobs at risk in this part of the world. You don't think there's a danger that people looking in will say, well, I mean, he's, he's in charge of a huge multinational. We feel we've already lost a lot of our sovereignty to Europe. Now we are leaving, losing it to big business too, who are sort of going to push us around if we decide to leave. No, I understand that concern, but uh, you, we've been a, a company in Britain here since the uh, 19th century. Uh, we have uh, a center of gravity here with our research centers, our factories. We have very much, and we continue to be very much a part of the uh, UK fabric, but we want it to be successful long term. But you may have heard voices say, look, if we vote no, if we you know, vote to leave, we, we could vote to leave and make a better Europe. We could have another one. We could sort of replace this one, which has lots of flaws, and we could try and build something a bit more effective. I don't think that Europe will just let the UK decide back and forth. Uh, you can go in, you can go out. But uh, if you go out, you will significantly, first of all, create insecurity that will destroy jobs here uh, and certainly put many other jobs at risk. There are three million people in the UK who make their jobs from trade with Europe, and you don't want to put these people at risk. I think that's one of the reasons that you see one of these rare occasions where the majority of the business community, as well as the labor unions and civil society, say overwhelmingly, it's in our interest to stay. But I can hear some of them saying, ah, oh, but you're the elite. We've been left behind. We've got nothing out of this. Yeah, it, um, again, I respect that. But uh, in the reality is I represent uh, quite a lot of employees here in the UK. But at a time in the world where you see a big trading block emerging in China, when the U.S. is talking about trading blocks or building walls around things, it is ludicrous to think that you can be alone in the U.K. and give up belonging to one of the most prosperous and biggest trading blocks, which is called Europe. We're talking here about 500 million people. You're talking here about the biggest economy, if you take it as a trading block. An economy, actually, where half of the exports of the U.K. depend on. Uh, staying on the site is not an option. Paul Polman talking to John earlier. Well, the clock continues to tick down to the deadline for registering to vote in the EU referendum. If you voted in last month's local elections, you are already registered. But if not, you've still got time to go to the government's voter registration site and sign up. We're told by the Electoral Commission that some 263,212 people have registered since midnight last night until about 4.30 this afternoon. And I'm joined here by some registered voters. Aaron Bastani, who's a political commentator who writes for a number of national newspapers. Jermaine Jackman, a Labour Party activist who many might recognise as the winner of the talent contest, The Voice. He wants to remain. And Ellie Hughes, who's a Conservative Party member who wants to leave the EU. Well, Ellie, let's start with you. I mean, as many as 30% of under 25s are thought not to be registered to vote. Why do you think that is? I think it's partly because there's not enough information out there. I mean, when I've been speaking to my friends, a lot of them don't seem to understand how to register. And once you explain it to them and they realise that it takes three minutes at the most, then they start to want to. It's just getting the information out there and teaching people how easy it is. Well, Jermaine, why, in your view, is it so important that under-25s do go and register and vote to remain, Absolutely. which is what you want to do? You know, young people make up a large amount of people in each constituency, and we are very influential if we all stand up and have our voices heard and have our vote counted. You know, um, we politicians have a prime responsibility to go out and reach out to young people and get them registered. Are you not hearing what you want to hear in this debate at the moment? Oh, I'm hearing a lot of things from both sides of the argument. I just want to urge young people to go out and register. they only got a few hours left um, and vote remain. Well, Aaron, you are very politically engaged, but you were very passionate 
um, pro-Brexit. Now right. you're wobbling. Why? A couple of reasons. Jean-Claude Juncker came out last weekend. I think the European Commission president. Precisely. They're making it quite clear that we'd be made an example of. That reminds me of Greece last summer. If we were to leave, I think there would be a recession. I think capital flight would be actually really significant. And a recession within the context of a right would drift in British politics generally. I think increasingly an absence of leadership on the left, and I'm talking particularly about Jeremy Corbyn, would Who be... you used to support. I, I love Jeremy Corbyn. I have been in his corner 99% of the time against, you know, in regard to arguments against the Parliamentary Labour Party, the media. But, um, yeah, I would be incredibly concerned in the context of recession, right-wing move in British politics generally, and then... Uh, what, that workers' rights wouldn't be protected, for example? I mean, you know what, there's a faction within the Conservative Party where I think whether or not we leave, they're hell-bent on doing this, right? Ditto free movement. So I think there has to be, for people that are passionate about migrant rights and workers' rights, they have to understand that the context here is much bigger than June 23rd. There is an agenda with the Tory right, whether we leave, whether we remain, this is why they're in politics. It's to do these things. That's what they're all about. Well, Ellie, isn't that the point that the EU has been good at protecting workers' rights, for example? Your 20 days guaranteed holiday a year. And that is in jeopardy, potentially, if we leave. I, I don't think that that's true at all. I mean, things like maternity leave, everyone says that the EU guarantees it, but we give extra maternity leave in the UK. Minimum wage is higher than in other countries in the EU. We go well above what the EU requires. So surely that's a case that we will protect our workers' rights no matter what happens. Right, so it's all project fear then, Jermaine. Absolutely. This Leave campaign and the whole Leave ethos has been about scaremongering, fearmongering. Oh, I was saying project fear by Remain, though. Oh, oh no, no, no. You know, if, I, if someone was telling lies about me, I would set up a press conf um, conference and I would want to send the record straight. And oh, that's but it was exactly... a bit pots and kettles, though, No, wasn't no that's it? exactly what David Cameron was doing today. He understood the severity of it. He understood that the Great British public were being misled by false facts and false information, and he wanted to set the record straight. Project Fear made you wobble, though, didn't it? Well, Juncker as well, but also, like I said, absence of leadership on the left. Um, but, but did Project Fear work for you in terms of bringing you over to remain? You know, there's a lot of risks attendant with leaving. And anybody who's passionate about progressive values, radical politics, understood that. The point is, I thought that there would be a much broader discussion if we do leave, right? Mm. Right now, what people call neoliberalism, weak unions, declining pay, is unseen. Right. And if we did leave the EU, that would then become, I think, subject to public debate to a much greater extent. Okay. My problem is the left would have a very, very tiny voice in that. Right. Nigel Farage is features in this debate tonight, the UKIP leader, bit of a Marmite figure. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Archbishop Welby, accused him today of legitimising racism. Let's listen to this clip now. I think that is an inexcusable pandering to people's worries and prejudices. That's giving legitimisation to racism. So what that going... is, is accentuating fear for political gain, and that is absolutely inexcusable. Well, Ellie, the Archbishop there saying that Nigel Farage risked legitimising racism against migrants by claiming that women risked being sexually assaulted by migrants. I mean, is he a bit of a liability for the Brexit campaign? I mean, I don't, I, I don't agree with what he said about women being at greater li risk of sexual assault by migrants. I think that's ridiculous. But I don't think that he is a liability to the campaign. In polls, he's come out as the most trusted person to talk about my immigration and migration. And he was also the second favourite to lead the Leave campaign behind Boris Johnson. I don't think he's a liability at all. And he's been working since well before I was born to get this referendum. And he's finally got it. And he should be able to lead it. Well, Ellie, Jermaine, Aaron, thank you very much for joining us.